Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will learn why the majority of the time, the book wins. Having said that, I am a huge movie buff, and do give unbiased reviews for both the book and the movie, ultimately. So whether you love books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this episode, so if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first, and then come back and listen to this. And now, without further ado, let's get right into it. Hello, and welcome back to Why the Book Wins. Today, we are talking about the book Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, A Savage Journey to the Heart of the American Dream by Hunter S. Thompson, published in 1972. And the movie, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, was directed by Terry Gilliam and was released in 1998. I have read this book before, but it was about 10 years ago now, and I have also seen the movie multiple times, but that too, the last time I watched it was like 2013, so it had been a while. And I actually used to love this book and movie, and in general, I just found Hunter S. Thompson to be a fascinating person. I no longer have, I don't know, I no longer have that much interest in him, I guess. And I don't associate with his books and stuff as much as I used to. And so this was my first time, like I said, reading the book and watching the movie in a while. And so... I don't know. It's just interesting to read it this time around with a different perspective, I guess. There is no denying the impact Thompson and this book and movie in particular have had on society. It has become so iconic. You see it referenced throughout pop culture and music and music videos and in other movies and in cartoons and in artwork. And you see his quotes all over the place. So regardless of how you feel about it, it's made an impact on our society. And so a summary... So Thompson was a journalist, and he started what he coined gonzo journalism, which means that he mixes fact with fiction. Even though this story is about him and his attorney, Oscar Zeta Acosta, or maybe not his attorney, but he was, Acosta was an attorney. Anyway, even if it's about these two real people, he doesn't use his real name. And he makes his character seem more like an alter ego, kind of. He refers to himself as Raul Duke. And Acosta is referred to as just like his attorney or the attorney, or he'll call him Dr. Gonzo sometimes. And so in this book, he tells us of a week, a week or so, he spent in Las Vegas with Acosta while they were both just on a cocktail of drugs, basically. And so this book, which Thompson gained most of his fame, had its genesis during the research for Strange Rumblings and Aztlan an expose for Rolling Stone on the 1970 killing of the Mexican-American television journalist Ruben Salazar. Salazar had been shot in the head at close range with a tear gas canister fired by officers of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department during the National Chicano Moratorium March against the Vietnam War. One of Thompson's sources for the story was Oscar Zeta Acosta, a prominent Mexican-American activist and attorney. Finding it difficult to talk in the racially tense atmosphere of Los Angeles, Thompson and Acosta decided to travel to Las Vegas and take advantage of an assignment by Sports Illustrated to write a 250-word photograph caption on the Mint 400 motorcycle race held there. So that is what led them to go there together. And then a little about Thompson. So Thompson's output declined from the mid-1970s as he struggled with the consequences of fame and complained that he could no longer merely report on events as he was too easily recognized. He was also known for his lifelong use of alcohol and illegal narcotics, his love for firearms, and his iconoclastic contempt for authority. He often remarked, I hate to advocate drugs, alcohol, violence, or insanity to anyone, but they have always worked for me. And a lot of people, this is a quote you'll see around a lot, and I don't know, we'll get to it. Like I'm about to talk about it right here, but uh, he ended up committing suicide, and there's just a lot of sad things about his life and so when people identify with him in a certain way or when they like have quotes like that as a you know a motto for their life or something I don't know I think before you do that you should look more into the person and you know that was his you know he may have said that but I don't know he says they've always worked for me but clearly it didn't work because I don't know his life came to a sad end but anyway 
Thompson died of suicide at the age of 67 following a series of health problems. In accordance with his wishes, his ashes were fired out of a cannon in a ceremony funded by his friend Johnny Depp and was attended by friends including then-Senator John Kerry and Jack Nicholson. Hari Kunzru wrote, The true voice of Thompson is revealed to be that of an American moralist, one who often makes himself ugly to expose the ugliness he sees around him. Years of alcohol and cocaine abuse contributed to his problem with depression. Thompson's inner circle told the press that he had been depressed and always found February a gloomy month, with football season over and the harsh Colorado winter weather. He was also upset over his advancing age and chronic medical problems, including a hip replacement. And he would frequently mutter, this kid is getting old. Rolling Stone published what Douglas Brinkley described as a suicide note written by Thompson to his wife titled, Football Season is Over. It read, no more games, no more bombs, no more walking, no more fun, no more swimming. 67, that is 17 years past 50. 17 more than I needed or wanted. Boring. I am always bitchy. No fun for anybody. 67. You are getting greedy. Act your age. Relax. This won't hurt. And then Thompson's collaborator and friend Ralph Steadman wrote, He told me 25 years ago that he would feel trapped if he didn't know he could commit suicide at any moment. I don't know if that's brave or stupid or what, but it was inevitable. I think the truth of what rings through all of his writing is that he meant what he said. If that is entertainment to you, well, that's okay. If you think that it enlightened you, well, that's even better. And so onto the book and my thoughts about it. So one of the reasons I liked this book when I was younger, like my late teens, early 20s, was in part just because it was weird. (laughs) And I guess I've always been kind of drawn to the weird stuff. Then, like I myself eventually started getting into some light drugs, nothing serious. And then I liked the movie even more and book because it was about drugs. Reading it now, honestly, I got bored. (laughs) It is a book with no plot when you get down to it. Both Thompson and his attorney are annoying, not to mention just sexist, racist, and in general, selfish and inconsiderate. Thompson, I mean, I guess he did have a unique writing style and he's able to capture the absurdity of what goes on and what drugs make you feel. He also contemplates contemplates the counterculture of the 60s and the way it failed to do what it set out to achieve. The book also has the subplot of him looking for the American dream, and there's a chapter where it's just a transcription of a recording between him, his attorney, and a waitress, directing them to what they think is the American dream. And that whole chapter just seemed kind of pointless, though I suppose it's supposed to make a point about how Americans don't even know what this American dream is. But nonetheless, this whole part of the book, I don't know, it was just unnecessary and kind of boring. In the book, he also like references a lot of people who were well known at the time and this is 1970 or 1971 and so now like 50 years later like most of these people I don't even know who they are and so when he uses that to describe someone or like he's referencing this other person like so often I was like okay well I have no idea what that means because I don't know who that person is and this was originally meant to be for a magazine and so It makes sense. Like when you're writing a book, you shouldn't do stuff like that. Like you shouldn't describe her eyes were like Zoe Deschanel, because even though people reading it now will know what you mean. But if your book is being read 50 years from now, people might not know who Zoe Deschanel is. And then that the reference is also just lazy too. like describe her eyes. Don't just say they look like someone else's. And so because this is a magazine article, it makes more sense that he just references these people because maybe he thought it was just going to be a magazine article and not a book that people would read decades later. But yeah, so that's another complaint I had. Anyway, I can't talk about this book and not bring up the illustrator illustrator Ralph Steadman. His artwork has a messy yet detailed look about it. And just like the book, his artwork isn't for everybody. I love his work because it's just so out there and it's distorted. It also just is a very fitting look for the type of thing that Thompson writes. Back in the day, I even had a t-shirt with his drawing of Thompson from this book. And then at one point I had a poster from like the cover with him, with Thompson and Gonzo and the car. Plus when I was living in student housing in college, we could paint murals on the walls and I got a permission to paint the Ralph Steadman cartoon of Hunter S. Thompson. So I was pretty into that. So on to the movie. After the release of this book, at various times, multiple directors tried to get this movie off the ground. 
However, it just never worked out until, until Terry Gilliam came along. He adapted the script as well as directed the movie. And Gilliam said, I want it to be one of the greatest movies of all time, as well as one of the most hated movies of all time. And I, yeah, like, I think a lot of people dislike this movie, but then a lot of people love it. So I would say he got what he wanted. But before we get into the main actors, there are so many cameos I want to mention. First off, we have Penn Gillette from the famous Las Vegas magic act Penn and Teller, which I had never noticed that before. So watching it this time was kind of funny to see him. And then we have Christina Ricci, Toby Maguire, Cameron Diaz, Gary Bussey, Mark Hammon, Debbie Reynolds, although it's just Debbie Reynolds' voice, but she recorded audio just for this movie specifically. So Debbie Reynolds uh, and Harry Dean Stanton. Toby Maguire plays the hitchhiker they pick up. And his character is wearing a shirt of like Mickey Mouse, but it's a Ralph Steadman cartoon drawing of Mickey Mouse. And then Gary Bussey plays the cop that pulls Duke over and he improvised the line where he asks him for a kiss. And this wasn't in the book and Gilliam just thought it was hilarious and he kept it in. So on to the main acting, we have Johnny Depp who plays Hunter S. Thompson. And in preparation for the role, he spent a lot of time with Thompson. Bill Murray played Hunter S. Thompson in a previous film from like 1980. And when he heard Depp was taking on the role, he called and said, be careful or you'll find yourself 10 years from now still doing him. Make sure your next role is some drastically different guy. So when Murray had played Thompson, he followed it up by working on Saturday Night Live. And apparently he just had a hard time breaking out of the Thompson character. And I read that a lot of people on that season of SNL, like just found him annoying to be around watching this now this movie has a lot of like Johnny Depp he has a lot of characteristics like that he's just now associated with and I think he did keep a bit of Thompson and he really applied some of that weird quirkiness to Jack Sparrow also much of the clothes worn by Depp were Thompson's own clothes that he gave Depp to wear and we have Benicio del Toro who's well cast as Dr. Gonzo aka the attorney aka Oscar Zita Acosta And he is great in this role. He and Depp both show the craziness and the comedy also comes off really well between them. The serious scenes are equally well done and the movie really rests on their shoulders, though there are a lot of side characters who are all excellent, but Del Toro and Depp, like it's, they're the main two and they're fantastic. And on a note about the real Acosta, he himself wrote two books of his own autobiography of a brown buffalo and revolt of the cockroach people. I think those are the only two. Um, And as of recording this, I'm halfway through autobiography of a brown buffalo. And I like it because you see a whole new side of Acosta. In Fear and Loathing, we don't get to like, we don't really get a feel for who he is as a person. And also some details from Fear and Loathing just make more sense too after reading about Acosta. For example, Thompson writes about how Acosta is often vomiting And in his own book, we learned that he has struggled with ulcers like his whole adult life and it causes major stomach issues and frequent vomiting. Because when I read the book and saw the movie, like I just thought it was from the drugs or something. But turns out it was like a chronic problem he had his whole life, whole adult life. He also talks about the need to shower every morning, no matter what. And so that gives a bit more context as to why he felt the need to stock up on soap while in Las Vegas. Like I said, I'm only halfway through the book right now, but I think as of right now, I would recommend it, especially to those who are fans of Hunter S. Thompson, because yeah, like this book is what Hunter S. Thompson is most famous for, and it's about him and Acosta, and yet we just see this one-dimensional caricature of who Acosta was. And so if you're a fan of this book, then I think you owe it to actually read about Acosta himself. Anyway... Onto the book and movie comparison. So regardless of how you ultimately feel about this book and movie, I think everyone can agree that the beginning of both, which they both start with the same line, but it's an amazing intro, like an amazing first line. So it reads, we were somewhere around Barstow on the edge of the desert when the drugs began to take hold. And yeah, (laughs) that's just a great way to start a book, I think. And it's followed by, I remember saying something like, I feel a bit lightheaded. Maybe you should drive. And suddenly there was a terrible roar all around us and the sky was full of what looked like huge bats, all swooping and screeching and diving around the car, which was going about 100 miles an hour with the top down to Las Vegas. And then when they later pull off to the side of the road, there's the line, 
where Thompson says, we can't stop here. This is backcountry. And in general, this book is just full of lines people love to quote and reference. And the movie includes a lot of quotes from the book because they rely heavily on narration. For the most part, I don't mind that because I think to turn this book into a movie, you couldn't really do it without a narrator. Though there were times where I felt like it was used more than necessary. Since we're seeing what is happening, like it didn't also have to be described over in narration. Specifically, the scene where they are on ether and going into Circus Circus, the book describes what is happening. And like, that's a, a good section from the book too. It's well written. But then the movie includes this narration as we're watching it happen. Like, I don't know, if we're already seeing it take place, then we don't really need it described to us as well. So that was a bit too much. While watching this movie, I often thought of A Scanner Darkly, which I reviewed last year, a year ago, over a year ago. Um, the two are very different, but what's similar is that they're both about drugs. In my review for Scanner, I said that the movie seemed to rely heavily on hallucinations to get the vibe of being under the influence, whereas the book really got in your head and made you feel the effects of the drugs in a deeper way. This movie does the same where it relies on the visuals more to make you feel it. One scene in particular is when Duke has a bad trip from taking adrenochrome, which is a made-up drug. The book doesn't mention hallucinations so much, but the movie just relies more on that and has this weird scene with crazy camera angles and like it's a well done scene and I get movies have have a hard time showing someone on drugs without relying on the visual effects but I don't know like Charlie Kaufman for example I think he does a great job of making you feel like you're on drugs with how weird his movies are and his movies aren't even about drugs they're just like just kind of weird movies that yeah they don't rely on like weird visuals for the most part. It's more just, I don't know. He just is able to create that atmosphere and just gets you in that vibe. But anyway, Thompson can describe the way drugs feel, but I don't, like I didn't feel like I was on drugs while I was reading it. For example, in Scanner Darkly, Philip K. Dick does a great job really putting you in the character's shoes and making you feel what they feel, which I guess like that's up to the reader if you want that kind of experience because A Scanner Darkly is about a guy who is kind of losing touch with the reality and going a little crazy. And while reading it, like, yeah, like you kind of feel like you're going crazy because he just puts you in the character's shoes so well. So I really liked it, but I don't know, maybe some readers don't want that immersive of an experience with a book like that. I don't know. Even though this movie is about drugs and alcohol, like it's not a movie about addiction, even though Thompson and the attorney are alcoholics and addicted to drugs. The story is shown in a, like it's a funny and entertaining way to look at drugs and Thompson and the attorney just seemingly show no remorse for their actions. If anything, this is the kind of book and movie people like when they're currently into drugs, whereas Scanner is kind of a warning about drug use. Fear and Loathing does have passages such as how many more nights and weird mornings can this terrible shit go on? How long can the body and the brain tolerate this doomstruck craziness? This grinding of teeth, this pouring of sweat, this pounding of blood in the temples, small blue veins gone amuck in front of the ears, 16, 70 hours with no sleep. But even that isn't really making you feel the danger of what all these drugs can do to you. And now I can't say how someone who hasn't done drugs views this book or movie, I can only speak for myself and my experience. And when I was into that lifestyle, I loved this book and movie for how wild and weird it was. But now watching it, even though the movie is funny at times and is well acted and well made, I just didn't enjoy it as much. Both characters in the book and movie are just so irresponsible and selfish. They harass three separate women, one of which they give LSD to even though she is under 18 and has never drugs done drugs before. And they just end up dumping her somewhere and leaving her. Well, they dump her off at a hotel, but still. And then, like, not to mention all the damage they cause to property that isn't theirs. So, I don't know. I guess I've grown up a bit since I had read this and seen this before. And so now I'm looking at it with, I don't know, a different perspective, as I said. And there were a few things from the book that were said that I assumed wouldn't be in the movie. Books can get away with saying some pretty risky stuff, especially back in 1971, but I thought it would be something that wouldn't fly in a movie that was made, like almost not 20 years later, actually almost 30 years later. 
Anyway, but the movie kept a lot of it in. Duke often marginalizes the attorney due to his race because Acosta was Hispanic. But in the book, he often calls him Samoan. But anyway, he'll say th- he'll say things like, despite his racial handicap, like whatever, so-and-so. And just a lot of things like that. And you could argue that, you know, like Thompson wasn't serious and it was just all in good fun because he and Acosta were friends. So he can say stuff like that and it's fine. But too often, white men make offensive jokes all in good fun, when truth be told, the person who is the brunt of the joke doesn't like it. They just put up with it because it's the easier thing to do. And back in the 60s and 70s, people got away with those racial remarks more often. And those racist lines were kept in the movie, and that kind of surprised me. He also has a line where he is talking about using the teenage girl to make money. And both, he isn't saying it seriously, but as a way to get the attorney to get rid of her. But still, it seemed... I don't know, pretty taboo, I guess. But the movie still included it. So the movie talks about the American dream aspect of the story, but it doesn't spend as much time on it as the book does, thankfully. The book talks about how Circus Circus is the main nerve of the American dream. And after dropping his attorney off at the airport the last time, he goes back there and he dwells on it more. And yeah, like once he drops the attorney off the second time, well, once the attorney leaves for the second time, the book... It just really started to drag at that point. And so when he talks about going back to the circus circus and whatever, it's just like, ugh, just wrap this up already. In the movie, we have the scene where they are at, I think it's called the Bazooka Circus in the movie. And it's because the real circus circus did not want to be associated with this. So they changed the name for the movie. But anyway, they have the line where they're there in the, like the middle of the movie And the attorney is getting the fear and it's because they are in the main nerve of the American dream. And so he's getting the fear. And even though the movie was more entertaining in some ways, even here, I started to get a bit bored near the end. And again, like once the attorney was dropped off and it's just kind of following the last bit of what Hunter S. Thompson is doing, it's, it drags, not as bad as the book, but it still started to drag a bit near the end. Also, the endings are a a bit different. Like in the end of the book, he gets on a plane and in the end, he's in the Colorado airport and that's just how it ends. Whereas in the movie, it ends with him driving his car, we assume back to LA. Another change from book to movie is the scene in the movie when he drops off his attorney at the airport at the end. And the crazy drive to the airport is the same in both book and movie. However, the movie adds the narration of Thompson saying, there he goes, one of God's own prototypes. Some kind of high-powered mutant, never ever, never even considered for mass production. Too weird to live, too rare to die. And this quote was not in the book, but is actually from the foreword written by Thompson for Acosta's own book titled Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo, which I mentioned. And at the time the foreword was written, Acosta had gone missing and he was assumed dead. And so that was in 1974 that he went missing. He went down to South America, I believe, to do something with his attorney stuff. Um, Yeah, and then he went missing and they assume he died. Anyway, in the past, like I said, I never looked into Acosta. This time around, I found it really interesting to learn more about him. And yeah, it just helped flesh him out more because based on fear and loathing, you just get this crazy look into who he was and he's definitely not portrayed as a good person. Yeah, anyway. His books are highly regarded though, even though they're not nearly well enough known. He was a lawyer in the Bay Area and was a civil rights activist. So in the end, whether I like the book or the movie, the book covers some serious subjects, but has a lot of comedy within it. However, I think the movie plays up the comedy more while maybe just touching slightly on the serious subjects. Overall, I think I would say I like the movie better. The book dragged near the end, as I said, whereas for the most part, the movie wraps things up quicker. Considering this is a story with basically no plot, it's impressive it can keep one interest at all, really. The movie also has some smaller changes that are done that make a big difference. For example, when he is watching the race, it is super dusty, so he has a bandana over his face, and they have a slit for his mouth so he can have his cigarette in his mouth still. So that was a nice touch. And then when Lasarda, who is the photographer for the race, Lasarda is in their hotel room talking about the motorcycle check-in, And Duke is watching the news on the Vietnam War at the same time. And so because he's on drugs, he starts to mix the two together. And he hallucinates that Lasarda is a military man listing off these motorcycles as if they are war machines or something. And that was an entertaining scene. And Lasarda Lasarda is played by Greg 
Birko, who has been in different things. But what I know him from is the scary movie comedies. Uh, so he plays Losarda in his role. He's really good in his role. Um, but another thing I also liked is there's a part where they're running back to the hotel room. And so it shows him running down the halls. And the way Depp, he, like, he's running, like, with himself pushed up against the, the wall as a way to, like, I don't know, keep him balanced. And I don't know. It was just a nice touch. And so, yeah, I just like that scene in particular of him running down the hall like that. So, like I said... I appreciate the imprint Hunter S. Thompson has had on society and the way this movie has become so iconic. However, I'm, yeah, I'm just not a huge fan of it anymore. I also think it's dangerous, like I also said earlier, to idolize someone like Thompson thinking you want to live the way he lived because he wasn't a happy person overall and he ended up committing suicide. Not saying someone who commits suicide can't be looked up to, but I don't know. You shouldn't idolize the way they live because the way they lived... Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) He wasn't happy and he resorted to drugs and alcohol as a way to like fill something inside of him. But ultimately that just kind of adds to depression and makes it worse. And he also, I don't know, he also wasn't, he, he had his faults. I'll just say that. Like he was sexist and racist, although I suppose one could say he was just a product of his environment considering back then most men were sexist and racist. But I don't know. It's fine to admire what he did in the world of writing, but I think it's important to see the whole picture of who he was. And I guess I'm saying this because I know for myself, 10 years ago, I kind of idolized him in a way. Now looking back, I'm like, man, like, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't taking the full picture in, I guess, basically. So that's one of the reasons why I have mixed feeling towards this now. Maybe if I always felt neutral about it, then I would like it more. But I'm looking at it through the eyes of someone who used to really identify with it in a certain way. And now looking back, I'm just like, man, like, (laughs) I don't know. It's not the best thing to identify with, I guess. But anyway, I guess that wraps it up for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Let me know your thoughts on the book and movie. And join me next week for a very exciting one. I'm talking about the book Wise Guy which is the basis for the movie Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese. Tune in for that one next week, and I will see you next time. And also, don't forget to head over to my YouTube channel and subscribe, youtube.com slash C slash Why the Book Wins. Or you can also find it through my blog, whythebookwins.com, and I link to my YouTube channel. But anyway, thanks so much for listening to this and for... Yeah, supporting my podcast just by listening. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks again for listening. If you want to find me on other platforms, you can check out my Facebook. So facebook.com slash why the book wins or my Instagram, which is all one word, why the book wins. Or you can go to my website, why the book wins.com. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can reach out to me on any of those. I also have a Buy Me A Coffee account where you can show your support by donating a couple bucks to the podcast. So that's buymeacoffee.com slash whythebookwins. But the fact that you are simply listening to the podcast means a lot to me and I really appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe and follow and tune in next Wednesday for the latest episode of Why the Book Wins.